and welcome to Woolly Mammoth Fibre Company podcast episode 14, I think. Um, my name's Emma, but I'm sure you know that and I go over this every time. I'm the dyer behind Woolly Mammoth Fibre Company. I'm from Northern Ireland. I use natural dyes and plastic free yarns and non superwash yarns and yada yada yada. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just wanted to come on here for a little episode today to talk about a couple... Well, I want to talk about my nurtured sweater actually, which I have just finished, and talk about the modifications that I did um, to that during the knitting process. And as well as that, I want to talk about some my scale grass sweater and some of the modifications that I made to that as well. And I wanted to show you as well a couple of swatches. Um, that I did for upcoming projects, which I did talk about, I think, in the last episode. Um, I would also like to talk a little bit about designing something, perhaps. And I will pop in a little bit of the footage. I went to visit Ulster Wool on Tuesday night and I took a few I took a bit of video, so you, I'll pop that in at the end. It's quite interesting to see how they take in all the fleeces. So Ulster Wool is part of British Wool, but anyway, I'll get into that later. Um, but it's quite interesting. The guy's kind of talking about how they grade fibre and stuff when it arrives and all of this type of thing. So, yeah, um, my nurture sweater, you probably, let's see if I can show it to you. So I'm wearing it with jeans. It doesn't look great with jeans because they're not high waisted jeans, but um, I'm really pleased with how this turned out, um, particularly because I did make some modifications and I wasn't sure if it was going to work. And yeah, I ended up basically just winging it at the end. <laughs> um, so the sleeves I knitted a chief gauge with perfectly. And then I, I cast on the body and I started knitting the body and I kept looking at it and thinking, that looks too big. And I was using the same needles, just a longer cable, obviously. Um, but it was definitely coming out too big. So I ripped out. So this kind of, I went through doing this like a couple of times before I was like, okay, I'm just going to cast on my stitches and see if I can like wing the rest of it. So um, I think you're supposed to cast on something like 100 and... 60 or 170 stitches or something for my size and I definitely wanted it not as big as that so I end up casting on 152 stitches and I was using iron weight yarn this is my Shetland iron weight yarn I forgot to say in the colorway winter's eve um so it has like little pops of color through it and I want I wanted to knit this to go with a high-waisted skirt that I have so yes, I cast on 152 stitches, um, knit it up to here, the oxter as we call that around here, or the armpit, <laughs> as other people call it. <laughs> and then I started doing the raglan as normal. And oh, by the way, this is not blocked yet. So <laughs> um, did the raglan and then got to the bit sitting kind of funny there. It doesn't look great. There we go. That's better. Got to the bit in the pattern that said about doing short rows and when I was approaching this part I was quite... let's just say I wanted to get this finished so that I could wear it. So anyway, in my great wisdom I decided to skip the short rows and continue with the raglan and then just um, knit the, the collar part. So that is what I did. Um, I've never, that's quite a radical change from the pattern, I think. But my favorite sweater, the Radari that I have, um, it fits great and it has no short rows. So I can understand why, why they're in the pattern, especially because of cropped, it could creep up at the back a bit. But, um, I just thought, you know what, I'm not going to do them. And I'm also going to decrease. Because a lot of sweaters in me, I don't know if it's the way I knit or because I'm quite a loose knitter, the sweaters often have quite a big neck. You'll see with my next project. So anyway, I cast right down to, 
I can't remember how many stitches, but um, I just winged it and then cast off and sure, it's fine, it's grand, nothing wrong with it. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty pleased with it and I love this stitch pattern, it's really nice. And as soon as I put this on, when I had it finished, I was totally astounded as to how warm it was. I'm not sure if it's because of the yarn or because of the stitch pattern or just a combination of the both, both of those things. But if I'd have had this sweater finished like a week or two ago when I ran out of oil in the house, I would have been toasty. It would have been all good. Um, so yeah, but I think my husband's quite interested in getting like a long one of these in this stitch pattern. He likes the pattern and the raglan and so on. So um, I might think about doing that for him at some point in the distant future. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm really pleased. Yeah, I forgot to say it's by Andrea Myrie, but I'm sure you know that. And yep. I don't have any more of this yarn in stock at the moment. I'll have a little bit in the next update. I think there's a tiny bit in the shop, but after that it's all gone. So I'll try and get some more if you're interested um, to, for me to dye some up for kits or something. Um, you can let me know what you think, what you prefer. So um, this is my skill grass wear. It's in my Alex Collins sweater sack, which I love. Um, I always find it difficult with sweaters to, oh yeah, look at this, with sweaters to um, get a bag big enough. I have quite a few smaller project bags and I find them really annoying for a sweater because you either have to like stuff it in or you just yeah when it gets big you just can't take like all your cakes and stuff as well because i have like all the yarn for this sweater in here plus scraps of other stuff so yeah it's really good for that and i absolutely love it so i'm knitting my scale grass sweater which is patterned by albina mclaughlin who is lb hand knits she's an irish designer um I'm knitting it in my Jacob's four ply, which I, it's, it's an absolute dream. I feel bad saying that because it's all gone, but there'll be more next year probably. Um, so I started knitting this a while, quite a while ago, and I stopped, um, I stopped when I finished the body because I want to cast on this because I had things that I really want to wear with this. So um, I picked it up again at the weekend, I think. Picked up the sleeve stitches and started knitting them. Oh, and a little Alex Collins DPN cozy. Um, you can tell I'm an Alex Collins fan. These things are amazing, by the way. If you haven't, it stops all the stitches coming off the needles. So yeah, I picked it up again at the weekend, started knitting on the first sleeve. So I got on really well, um, but you can see what I mean about the neck. It's so wide on me, even though the rest of it will fit me perfectly. So what I'm gonna do, I think, is go along, pick up these stitches and do a few rounds of decrease maybe. I don't know if it'll work, but I prefer a slightly tighter neckline. And once I, block it will probably just get bigger so um yeah i'll probably just go along and pick up like the first row of stitches the whole way around or something like that and then decrease 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 so the sleeves on this pattern are supposed to be like three quarter length sleeves which i do like but i feel like i would get more more wear out of a long sleeve, especially in this color. So I am winging it again. So basically I'm at the three quarter length bit, but I'm just like decreasing two stitches every 10 rows. So I hope it's gonna be okay. Um, you can see 
I have like quite a bit to go so it should be sort of fairly neat around the cuffs and so on um and then I'm just going to do an I-core bind off in the pattern it says to do um some of the lace work but I think I'm going to skip that and just do like a plain sleeve with an I-core bind off I think it'll look really nice and um, the I-core bind off I've already done it in the in the hem and then on the collar part um it's another I-cord bind off so um yeah I don't know how you I haven't looked at the pattern in a while so I'm not sure how you do that when you've already you must pick up the stitches maybe I'm not sure so yeah I'm really pleased the fabric I love this fabric um the Jacobs has a really beautiful character and it's actually fairly soft I would say and it has its beautiful colour all of its own I didn't dye this or anything um and yeah I really I'm totally in love with Jacobs it's so nice so I can't wait to wear this it's gonna be really good so we will see how my self-made mo modifications go on that. Um, so we'll put it back in its little house here in the Alex Collins bag. And I do have some of these left in the shop actually, if you're interested. Okay, so since the last podcast, I had talked about Pinguono, a naturally dyed Pinguono. Um, something to pull over baggy t-shirts, which I have quite a few of. So just something really cosy that I can pull over in the house um, and outside of the house too, but particularly in the house if it's chilly or whatever. So over the last few months, as I've started to launch limited edition yarns, like local yarns to me, that I have personally picked the poo out of for you. <laughs> um, uh, I have collected quite a few of them and I'm interested to make a naturally dyed pinguono. So I had um, been knitting a soldotna crop, but it was coming out, the gauge was all wrong, so I ripped it out saved the yarn and I'm now making a pinguono. So I kind of, I don't have any mohair in the shop and I like to try and like keep things local if I can. Um, so I had two, two skeins of Whistle Bear's uh, weavering bell. Yeah, let me just get it here, which is Sorry about that. Which is 80% mohair and 20% oh, needle, 20% Wensley deal. And this is from their own flock, which is in England, and it's hand dyed. So I had two skeins of this. I'll probably need some more to finish the pinguono. So I will hold this with my limited edition yarn. Um and it's this. I can't even describe to you like what this is like. It's like an absolute dream. It's so nice, but it still feels like woolly in a way. Like it still feels like a, like when you look at it and look at my Wensley deal, you can see similarities, but obviously it has a far greater halo because of the mohair, which will be really nice. Um, when I have it next to my skin, it'll make, it'll be really cozy, I think. And this is what the skein of it looks like. Wavering Bell four ply. So I did my swatch. I did about 20 gazillion swatches to get the right needle size and the, the nice fabric. So I held this with my Causeway yarn, which again, sorry, is sold out right now. But news on that, um, I'm gonna be getting quite a lot of it this year. Um, I think it may have slightly changed though. I don't think there's going to be any south down in it. I'm not 100% sure, or there might be a little bit. Um, but I'll keep you posted on that. So it'll 
potentially be a different yarn but from the same farmer so we'll see how that goes but anyway so this is what um it looks like held double um and the fabrics worked out really nice so i have not blocked this yet but generally i find that um like hand dye yarns don't bloom that much because obviously the dyer has already soaked them several times and um, so they don't really bloom in the same way that if you buy say for example an undyed yarn like my jacobs which i didn't soak before selling um it would bloom so then your gauge might be off so but i probably will just block this anyway just to have so you can see what it's like and i've put my yarn overs in to remind me what needle i use so this is five millimeter needle um and if it was like 5.25 what i might do is like put five and then one or if it was like 5.5 i put like five and then two or something like that um so yeah i think i must have seen this on someone's podcast or something but it's a really good idea because all the tags i put usually like a little tag on my swatch to remind me like what size of needle i use and what project it's for and stuff but they usually fall off so this is much better so yeah i'm gonna get start up my penguin o pretty soon i think um after as soon as i finish my scale graph swear um which means love story in irish um so yeah, some of the colours that I'm going to be using in my Pengono are this. So yeah, like I said, I'm kind of on like a yarn ban in 2020. However, I'm going to need a few more skeins of this, maybe in a different colour to finish my Pengono. So I'll allow myself that. I'll not be, I'll not be too strict. So here we go. I'll just show you them all. Uh, what else? This one. So here's some of the colours and I will probably just add more to that and I put I might put some Jacobs in as well. And yeah, so with this. <laughs> so that's the plan with that. Next thing I want to briefly talk about is I'm thinking about designing a shawl. Um, some of you may have remembered from ages ago, I was thinking of designing a shawl with a lace panel. Let me just get this i knitted one and gave it to my granny and made some notes about how i wanted to change the design if i were to um go ahead and launch it so my aim for this year is to try and design one thing um and launch it as a pattern just to see if i can do it my brain doesn't generally work that way so i think i'll need some help probably um from a tech editor 100 percent definitely um and obviously i'll need test knitters and stuff like that but it's kind of an, a new process to me i don't really know how it all works and i'm kind of curious to see how the whole thing does work um so yeah so i started designing the shawl in my cumbrian four ply yeah um, so this has been kind of hibernating for, do you like my little badge? Dobby is free, I don't know if you can see that. So yeah, I started, um, I started doing this like, well my first prototype was, I started it in March 2019 so a year ago pretty much and then i started this one not that long after i finished the first one so my aim is to basically get this finished this get this finished this year um i try and launch it i just think it would be good a good process for me to understand so yeah it's gonna be basically this with a lace panel and then some more garter so not nothing fancy but it should be nice i think um 
So yeah, that's that. I wanted to show you this little swatch of my Chariot. I haven't blocked it yet. Um, which I'm going to have more of this in my next shop update on the 27th of March at 8pm GMT. Um, I have quite a bit of this actually. I think I have another like, after I've died for this update, I might have like 180 skeins or something. Um, so this is what it's like knitted up. It would be better if it was blocked because you'd see how it blooms because obviously I haven't dyed this so it hasn't been soaked yet. So I would say I wouldn't, it's not not soft but it's not soft either. It's a funny one because when it's knit it, it feels more, it almost feels nicer knit it than it does in the cake. Um, I've knitted this on a quite a loose gauge um so yeah i my feeling was when i swatched with this was that it would be really nice for lace work shawl um or potentially color work Um, it has it's woolen spun and the fiber was grown in the glens of antrim by um a girl called brona I did an episode with her like two episodes ago. So I did like an interview with her and she talks about her sheep and her sheep dogs and stuff. Um, so yeah, it's you can see a, like a little bit of Kempe fiber in it, I would say, or a little bit of Kempe hairs. It's a very creamy white. It's quite like a pure, pure white. Um, this is what it looks like compared to the tea's water in South Down. So it's whiter, I would say. The tea's water is more creamy. Um, I would say it's not lustrous. Um, I would say that it is the type of yarn you could also, it would just make a really good jumper because it just, it feels like it would be hard wearing but soft enough also just to have to be in daily use. And I'd be interested to see how this kind of develops as you wear it. I think it could really, I think it could be really beautiful. And Cheviot, this is from Wicklow Cheviots. And they're a hill sheep. So yeah, it's nice to be able to use this because normally this stuff goes into like carpets or whatever. So Yep, I'm really pleased with that. And I am going to knit a pair of fingerless mittens. Uh, I'm going to knit a pattern by uh, Skeen Deer. I can't remember what it's called, but I think it's like a winter scene, blue and white. So yeah, I think that is probably it. I could show you some shop stuff if you fancy it. Let me go get some stuff. So this is some of the Cheviot that I dyed. I actually dyed it just yesterday. That's why it's still like this, because it's still drying, you see. And uh, I love this color. It's so, oh, it's just so nice. And it's, I would say the color is a little bit darker and a little bit slightly more purple than you can see in the screen there. But yeah, this along with this would make something really nice, but I don't know what. <laughs> So this will be in the next update. I have been talking a bit about, because I've been making the same kits for the Vera Valamaki Stay Soft Shawl for quite some time. I thought, yeah, why don't I make something different? So um, I made a different couple of combinations and um, this these kits are in my BFL Gotland base. So undyed, purple and like purpley grey. So that's what they look like. So this is one option, which I think is really nice. The next option, which is very springy, which I love is, this is my personal favourite that I would be definitely knitting this shawl in if I was uh, knitting, knitting one. 
I just think these colours together sort of buzz. They're really like bright and springy and again the middle one's undyed. But doesn't it look so good? I really like that. And I'm gonna have like quite a lot of natural sock and just random nice springy pastel-y punchy kind of colours. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed that little short episode today. Actually, it wasn't too short. It was um, longer than I intended. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed it and I'll maybe see you next week. We'll see how things go. Bye. Are the group fun or? Well, uh, yeah. You, you produce some wool as well? Yes. Yeah. Uh, what breeds have you got there? Crossbreds, you know. Um, right. Yeah. You don't use them for spinning? Um, not really, no. no. I've got one mess up. Oh, yeah. that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Keep together. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is a lot that's come out of the stack. As you can see, there'll be tags on them. These, uh, these here. Out there, where the tally doesn't work with all the front. So, whenever the guys bring them out of the bin at the back, he knows what bales are what. And uh, once you, this is the same print out. Once that comes down, this tells me who, what the farmer is. His name will come up in the system here. There's Alan's grading, he's a previous grader, and then there's myself. You type in who's grading it, you type in what type of wool, and uh, you process it that. Every, every individual fleece. When you look at that clip there, you know it's a, like a Texel mule clip because of the crimp in it. It's coming from the, the mule side, but there's it's a lot of softer stuff in it too. Makes it it's spread more towards the half bread. So those are the more complicated ones to breed or to grade because that can go either way. You could put that into a mule grade or it can go into a half bread grade. So it's just for years of doing it, mm. you know where it needs to go. Most of our wool here wouldn't be rolled. That's a nice clip that comes mm -hmm. in. Like you can lift that fleece. We try to pack as much straw and stuff out of it as we can as well. But um, it's just the process of opening it and you see if it's white or you see if the staple's strong enough. You know by looking at it if it's a hog or not, those aren't hogs. As a hog would have a long spiky tip mm -hmm. and uh, I'm sure spinning would like the mm -hmm. hogs because it's a longer staple. But uh, a lot of our wools would be that type, Texel real cross. I think uh, number two would be the finer wools, would be like a two three twos. That would be our bulk grade. Unfortunately, it's not worth very much, maybe 58p or that, but that's where it's coming from. It's coming through mm -hmm. from the Texels and the Suffolk type wool, would be the bulk of our wools. But other than that, it's not. You still get more for your wool here whenever it's presented well. And look at there's a good quality. Clip that's probably come in in maybe June time mm -hmm. and that's come out of the stack so it's still good and white but you need to look out for the like of your cots it would be a matted fleece that there you need to go mm -hmm. to another type of process mm -hmm. for uh, it goes to the same place only it's more expensive it has to go through another machine to get that ripped up so it's just all them types of things add up so all the grade is on the floor I think we could have maybe 78 or something that we use over here, but other depots would be using grades that we don't have, but like the over Wagartha's or them um, Welsh breeds and stuff, but as we wouldn't have any of them type, we just take the this type of wool in this country. So. so the main ones that you'd be dealing with then would be oh, the main Texel. Texels, mules. Yeah. We get a lot of blackface as well in the right. mountains and yeah. Cheviot wool. Yeah. We don't get a lot of the finer Cheviot, the Cheviot fine wools quite a good price but out of the 616s would be the best Cheviot and we only made two bales of it this year. Oh, the rest mm. would be going to Cheviot Cross where yeah. a lot of people would cross yeah. them with. Yeah. That's the problem with farmers, they one year of something then they breed it along something else and then it's... Presumably that's just because it focuses yeah. primarily on meat production, yeah. is it? I have something interesting every year because there's actually fleeces this year I've found that <clears throat> looks like a mule in the front, but whenever you turn it over, it's a black face, which just catches a lot of boys out now. And But it's just the way you have yeah. to grade it. Yeah. 
to a type rather than a breed because a lot of that wool there we would have to put that say if it was too long and lashy it would have to go into it like a gray face grade but somebody could ring up and say i don't have any gray face but that's where it has to go that's where right. it fits best mm -hmm. yeah. that's where it'll go it doesn't get a complaint right yeah. with quality control boys it would come over <clears throat> every three weeks and they would go through what we he would grade along with each grader he'd grade along with me for a day he'd grade yeah. along with Alan, and then he would go down look through the wool on the skips and he opens two bales and he makes sure that everything is to the quality of yeah. what it should be yeah. it keeps everything honest and not that you're trying to take shortcuts but you know what you do whenever they open it if you open a bale at 360 kilos and he brings out one fleece you know you're doing something right so mm. and they've never had any problem with what we have done here so yeah. far so yeah, that's, that's a good start anyway mm. so we'll move on down the floor do you want to see different types of wool or yeah, yeah. well unfortunately the lichen is not the best under here as you can see be the Chevy. Well, this is number two green, unfortunately. See that wee bit of colour in it, but Chevy, you can feel that as soon as you touch it, it's sort of more of a, a drier feel to it. Mm -hmm. That's a hill wool. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you all know that anyway. But we don't make that many of the, the shorter <laughs> ones, you know. And then we've seen. In every grade, with there's hogs number one and number two. There's ewes number one, number two.